good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Webb McCray, and if you live in Cumberland County, I am your Cumberland County prosecutor. We're here with another episode of Coping with COVID. Um, if you've been following our Facebook page, you know that we've done these throughout this world health pandemic, and the Coping with COVID series is about educating our public about the services that are still available to help them in Cumberland County. So we've done a number of these with our stakeholders uh, in Cumberland County. And if you're interested in looking at back at some of the, the um, episodes, you can go to the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office YouTube page. So um, today we have a very interesting session. This session is gonna inform the public on the process and resources available for anyone who has been a, a victim of sexual assault and what to do even with the restrictions of social distancing. So I'm very excited today because we have with us both our SANE START nurse and that's uh, Tony Katari. Welcome, Tony. And we also have our Director of Victim Witness Services and that's Ms. Lorena Diaz. She's here with us today and as usual, my trusty special agent, Matt Rudd, who is sort of the informal producer of these sessions, is here with us as well. So I'm going to start the episode by asking Tony to give us a little information about the SANE SART program and what she does as the SANE SART nurse director of that program. Welcome, Tony. Thank you and good morning. Um, my name is Tony Cataldi. I am the forensic nurse coordinator for both Salem and Cumberland County. Um, we provide services to victims, um, and I may use interchangeably patient or survivor um, of sexual abuse. Um, we provide services, it's including, includes law enforcement, as well as a specially trained rape care advocate, which is served by uh, services empowering rights of victims, uh, known as SERVE, and it's a victim-centered approach and it's a medical legal exam as well. So um, I'm hoping today's session um, will be encouraging people that, that it's still safe to come to hospital to get your examinations done. Yes, and one very unique uh, thing about here in Cumberland County is that um, our Director of Victim Witness Services, Lorena, who has been with us for a very long time. How many years have you been with us, Lorena? So I've been um, the Director of Victim Witness Services for the last almost three years. Uh, prior to that, I was a one of the victim advocates assigned to the Victim Witness Unit for about 12 years. Okay. And during your time here as an advocate, you also became a nurse, right? That's correct. Um, while working here, I met our former um, SANE coordinator. And um, after talking to her and having a background in science, um, I just fell in love with the concept of uh, providing uh, health care for victims of crime, um, just because I was already providing resources to victims of crime, but it was a nice component to include the nursing portion. So I went back to school and um, got my registered nursing license and uh, went back to get the SANE certification. Yes. So um, I hope that that shows our, our victims, our uh, uh, people who we interface with that that the, vic the Office of Victim Witness Services here at the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office does place an emphasis on being knowledgeable about the services that our SANE SART uh, program does provide. And we not only have Tony who can give us great information about that, but we have a director who's directly in charge of all of the advocates who appreciates the program and can also provide information about the program. So I'm gonna get right into it. Can I just, just real quick before we get too much further, I want just for our, our viewers to notice that when we say SANE or SAR, that stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner, is that right? That's and correct. Um, um, sexual assault SANE is, is uh, we still use the term SANE, but it's uh, a really forensic nurse examiner program uh, and a sexual assault response team. And then, Tony, what else does SART stand for when we say S-A-R-T? Sexual Assault Response Team. Yep, good. Thank you. So I'm going to get right into the questions. 
First question is, COVID-19 is still affecting our daily lives and adding to the confusion of what to do and where to find help. Help us understand what someone should do or where they can find help if they are a victim of sexual assault. First of all, they should try to get to a safe place. Um, the New Jersey um, Attorney General's guidelines provides uh, a victim-centered approach for all victims of sexual assault. So you actually have lots of choices. Um, you can come into the hospital with law enforcement if you choose to report. Uh, you could call the Rape Care Advocacy Line and uh, speak to an advocate and then come into hospital. Um, or you can just show up at the hospital. Um, all the choices are up to the, the person. Um, you actually have time to report. Um, we have a five-day window to do a forensic exam. Um, and all the choices are up to you. You could have all of the team, which includes the forensic nurse, the advocate, and law enforcement. One, one part of the team or none of the team. It's totally up to you. And when you talk about the rape care advocacy line, um, do you have that number accessible? If you don't, I want to... I do. Okay, wonderful. Um, the hotline is 800-225-0196. And what, what we will do is once we air this session, we will put that information in the comments. So if people are looking to access the information, it will be in the comments um, on our Facebook page and uh, we'll put it on YouTube as well. So what, be that what would happen if someone calls that line? Like when, when someone dials that number, what, what can they expect? Well, there's someone on the hotline 24 seven to answer and guide you through all the questions you may have, give you the options that you have moving forward and uh, actually be a support person for you through the whole process. So Tony, um, you know, some people may be reluctant to have law enforcement involved, involved from the beginning. They might say, well, I want to think about that, whether or not I want to officially report this as a crime. But we know it's really important to, if there is physical evidence, to obtain that in that five-day window. So can you talk about what a person would do if, they, if they're not really sure they want law enforcement involved? but they do want to go through the process of possibly getting a rape kit and getting an examination. They could actually go into uh, either of our Inspira sites. We have two hospital sites. Uh, we're in partnership with in Inspira Health System. We have a site at their Vineland uh, Medical Center and also their Bridgeton um, Emergency Department. And uh, you can just walk in and tell them that, you know, you, you were sexually abused and they will call the nurse. You have, according to the New Jersey guidelines, up to five years to have that kit held. So if you are not in the mental frame to move forward, you're not sure whether you want law enforcement involved, you can still have the kit done. And um, we, would, we would secure your information and um, the kit would go to our prosecutor's office and be held for you up to five years. And, and the five year the five-year window would start at age 18. So if you were 16 or 17 and came in, you were unsure if you wanted to report uh, on your 18th birthday, that five-day window would start. So five that year, five year sorry, five window, window is for yeah, five years. We're, I'm going to give you the lawyer's point of view. That five-year window is um, attached to the five-year statute of limitations. And with respect to um, our young people, that doesn't start to run until they're, they're 18 years old. And in addition to that, there's some right now because of the change in the law, some exceptions to this window, but the general um, rule of thumb is that we can hold that kit for up to five years so that if you change your mind and you want to, to report uh, a sexual thought to law enforcement, then um, we can process that kit and we can get you justice. So that's really, really important to know. So, so it seems like it's really important that, I mean, that option means um, the encouragement is go secure the physical evidence really as soon as possible, right? And, and you could do that kind of like um, there's, a, there's a, a progression to it. So if, if you've been sexually assaulted, go to the hospital, let them know, they will take care of you. They will administer, or is that, I mean, is that your team? Is that Actually, who, our team who, does that, yes. Um, yeah. 
Medical management is a huge part of what we do as forensic nurses. So not only are you getting the forensic examination itself, you're also getting medically managed. Um, the nurses in contact with an emergency physician, um, the exams of no cost to you. It is fully um, free to the victim unless they need x-rays or anything that would not be under the umbrella of the forensic exam. We provide medications to treat sexually transmitted disease HIV and uh, emergency contraception. So coming in and getting your medical management is a huge piece of this. And we encourage people to come in because uh, we don't want this incident to result in any kind of healthcare issues further down the line. And then you can also have the, the forensic kit completed as long as you're there within a five day window. And then we will secure the evidence for you at the prosecutor's office until, you, until you'd make a decision because so you're, a lot of times um, your brain is not ready to process what has happened to you. And that is called the neurobiology of trauma. And um, so your, your memories may be fragmented and you may not be sure you wanna move forward or you may think you did something wrong or you may think that this is a family member and you don't know what the repercussions moving forward will be for your family. Um, so it gives you time to process, gives your time, your brain to assimilate what has happened, and, and you will be given choices of what you can do to move forward. And uh, this will, you know, come with time. And this is not abnormal to have these types of feelings or not know how to move forward. And we're there to guide you and give you your, give you an educated options of what you can do so you're fully informed. And I think that the okay. idea is having the, the rape kit administered and that forensic kit gathered is not the same thing as reporting. That's, I think that's the important distinction. Once the victim decides they want to move forward with the, the legal case that's associated with, with the assault, then that forensic evidence that's been gathered is what will be used. But getting that, getting that, um, the kit administered in the hospital is not the same thing as reporting. Am I understanding that? That's correct. Okay. So um, you touched a little bit about, upon the fact that um, there's a traumatic, a, a psychological component to this as well, um, which I'm glad that, um, you know, in the criminal justice world, we're catching up to the, the um, innovative work that has been done in the field of women's rights, um, in the field of sexual trauma to realize that any crime has a, an element of, of trauma, right? So this gives the um, person time to process everything and to make educated decisions that they don't have to make in split seconds um, while still giving us the avenue to have to put our best foot forward if a person elects to prosecute. So getting back to trauma though, um, Perhaps you, Lorena, could talk a little bit about what CERV does when they send an, an advocate um, to the hospital or to make contact with someone and how we play a part in that as well, possibly with counseling services. So if you talk a little bit about that now. Right. So the CERV advocate is part of the sexual assault response team. So whenever there's a case um, and the SART team gets activated, they respond and they meet with the client, with the patient. And um, they go over resources and they also offer essentially the option to accompany them, to accompany them during the forensic medical exam. Uh, prior to COVID, they were coming in person, um, but post COVID, they, they still offer um, that assistance, but it's uh, via tablet, correct me if I'm wrong, Tony. It's um, right, now it's, right now it's telephonically. Uh, we have purchased I iPads. Um, so they will have, they can see one's, someone's face. They actually have the right to speak to an advocate, especially trained advocate, before they speak to a forensic nurse or law enforcement. Right, so, and, and this CERV advocate um, is part of the uh, Center for Family Services, and they provide not only services for victims of sexual assault, but also victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. Um, I know uh, Tony had provided the 24-7 hotline number, but if you don't feel comfortable calling them by phone, you also have the option to chat with them online. And um, that website is uh, center, 
ffs.org um, slash serve, S-E-R-V. Uh, so that's also an option and they provide confidential phone and virtual uh, sessions uh, for individual counseling, uh, safety planning and emergency shelter. Um, despite COVID, like um, Tony said, they are available 24 seven and their safe houses remain fully functional as well. So just because you were kind of going in and out a little bit, we're talking about the Center for Family Services um, and the SERVE program, it's Services Empowering the Rights of Victims. And that is the designated uh, provider for the County of Cumberland. So we will have that information in our chat line as well. Uh, Lorena, can you talk a little bit about what our how our advocates interface and let's, um, pose the hypothetical question that we have someone who went to the hospital, they got their rape kit done, they, they're still not sure whether they want to uh, report to law enforcement. Can they contact our office and get help from our advocates or what would our response be to that? They can. Um, we actually get a referral from the SART coordinator. So we actually do our own follow-up um, after we receive the referral. Uh, we reach out to the, the patient, we, talk, we tell them who we are. Um, and for those that, that don't know a little bit about victim witness, um, um, we provide services to help victims cope with the aftermath of the victimization and kind of help their participation in the criminal justice system less difficult. So there, there's a few components of what we offer. Um, if there, there are criminal charges, um, you know, we provide court notifications, court accompaniment. But in terms of those referrals, uh, we talk, we, double check to make sure they have, uh, if they have any follow-up questions in terms of um, whether or not they want to file criminal charges, uh, let them know what that process may look like. Um, if they have any follow-up medical questions, sometimes we may refer them to the Cumberland County Health Department um, or our community health care centers such as Complete Care. And then um, if they are interested in, let's say, counseling um, other than serve, um, but they don't have health insurance, then we help um, help them with that application with one of our agencies that we use, which is called Victims to Crime Compensation Office, that can help victims with those expenses that they incur as a result of the crime. Wonderful. So I know one of the hesitations or agitations that are happening right now as a result of the pandemic and COVID is that people are afraid to go to the hospital. Um, can you talk a little bit about why it's still safe to go to the hospital if you have, um, you know, if you have to, to, to address one of these issues and what's the best way to make that happen? Well, our partners at Inspira Health uh, make it safe for everybody that comes in, no matter what your uh, emergency is. Um, you get your temperature taken at the door, you're placed in a private room, mostly all the rooms in the emergency departments are private rooms now. Uh, hospital personnel are keeping you safe wearing their PPE. Um, forensic nurses, when they come in, will also wear PPE. Um, we'll be carrying a badge that we have to show you what our face looks like without the double mask and the goggles on. And uh, we, we are doing everything we can to protect you from any other infection that's going on in the hospital. Um, so we are there with all the preventive measures, to, measures that we can provide to keep you safe while you're there. Um, don't hesitate or be afraid to come in because we are there to help you. You're with the forensic nurse the full time you're there. You basically have a one-on-one -on -one nursing relationship with the forensic nurse the whole time you're there. They'll be um, getting your information. They'll be doing your forensic exam. They will also be administering your medications to make sure you understand them, giving your options for medications. So it's important to come in and get your medical management and, and please know that you are safe at the hospital. And Wonderful. while you're at it, Tony, could you also talk about confidentiality? Because it's such a sensitive reality. Assault is, is really, um, it's a vulnerable reality. Can, can you talk about confidentiality and then even in terms of the referral process and, and Lorena mentioned that, you know, how does, how does everybody manage confidentiality in this case? Well, everything when you come in uh, is uh, confidential between you and the forensic nurse um, and the advocate. 
if you are choosing not to report, anything you tell the nurse will go into your report. Um, if you are choosing to report to law enforcement, our report goes to law enforcement, our forensic report. So anything you tell me, law enforcement does have the right to view and see. If you're not reporting, that information is secured. On the outside of the envelope of the report and on the outside of the, the kit itself, it says Jane Doe, John Doe. So your name is protected. Um, the hospital has HIPAA violations. They can't discuss anything of your medical management with anyone. It's against the law. That's helpful. So um, one thing that I really want to stress at this point is that it is this program is set up to help victims of sexual assault. And it is ideal um, for us to get this information out to the public so that they know that that five day window is, is important, essential, and um, you know will give us the best possible way to have a case where we can put our best foot forward. However, it is very common and not atypical. So it's, it's common for people to report sexual assault at a later date, um, maybe, sometimes many years later, um, if they were a child when the assault occurred. And what I want people to know is that I don't want them to be discouraged from reporting sexual assault at any time um, because we are in a position to get people help um, even if there's a reason why we cannot prosecute. But there oftentimes are ways that we can prosecute cases that are reported many um, months and many years later. Um, but even if that's not the option or route that a person chooses to take, we can help provide services to address trauma, as well as to help that person move on from um, the assault. So while we're talking about this very wonderful program that helps, helps us put our best foot forward with prosecution, if you are a victim of sexual assault and you want to report it, we are encouraging you to do that. And you can do that at your local um, law enforcement agency. You can also do that through the rape care advocacy line, even if it's after five days. Is that correct, Tony? Yes, that's correct. And they will guide you appropriately on, um, you know, getting in connection with CERB or getting in connection with our office so that we can provide the wraparound services that will be helpful to someone in this situation. So I wanna pivot just a little bit and talk about um, children. So all we see, and it's very common, that um, parents have to navigate the system on behalf of their, their children, their youth under 18, or sometimes help young adults navigate this, this um, this world um, and we want to give parents information that can help them do that. Um, so is there anything different or um, what recommendations would you, you give to parents who are reporting on behalf of a child? Okay, children, as you know, prosecutor, do not routinely report in a timely five-day manner. But if you have a child who is reporting within that five-day window, um, you should bring them to the hospital. Um, there is a forensic nurse on call 24 seven. Um, the Regional Diagnostic Center for Southern New Jersey is Rowan's Cares Institute. And maybe we can put that number in our numbers at the end of this uh, program. Um, Rowan's Care Institute provides a one-stop shop for parents. They offer counseling services for children. Um, they get you plugged into social services. Um, but they're only open on a um, business hours basis. So anything happens after the normal business hour, weekends or holidays, um, we recommend you, and it's within that five day window, we recommend that you come to the hospital and the forensic nurse will come out and, and we will move forward and see the best way for you to um, what should be done for your child. And it's on a case by case basis. The forensic nurse is in contact um, with the Rowan's Care on call doctor for their recommendations on what should be done um, for this exam. This exam will be a limited exam unless there's injury um, and a chance to collect any type of DNA evidence. 
And then and again, it, the nurse is in consult with the Rowan Cares doctor on call. Once that exam is complete, then um, we have a, a child advocacy center here at our, our Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office. Um, law enforcement has specially trained officers that will interview and um, you will get referrals um, to the Rowan's Cares Institute for your follow-up care. And uh, there's also advocacy through our office, um, which I'm sure Lorena can speak to, that will help you move forward through the criminal justice system and how, how to move forward from there. So just um, because we want to be transparent and we want um, parents to know what to expect, what are our obligations as uh, reporters if there's abuse or neglect? Um, um, nurses are mandatory reporters and any type of abuse they would have to um, report to um, child advocacy, uh, formerly known as DIFUS. So we would be making a call to them as well. Jeez. They will follow up with your child. Sometimes they will respond to the hospital um, not so much during COVID right now. They're responding telephonically or doing a home visit. Um, it depends on the situation. Is the child safe um, at that point? And we have to come up with a safety plan moving forward. And they are involved with that as well as our office at the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office to provide a safety plan for the child. Yes. So um, let's talk about our Child Advocacy Center just a little bit here. Um, so with respect to a child who is a victim of sexual assault, um, we were able, I'm very proud of our team, which includes Tony and Lorena um, and Matt to a certain extent because he's all things grants at our office. We were able to open our Child Advocacy Center in December of 2019. Um, and it's an offsite location Tony has an office at the, at the Advocacy Center. We also have uh, forensic interview rooms for children. So the, the um, thought process is that if you are a, a child victim under the age of 13 um, and you are a victim of sexual assault or abuse, you would not be taken to a police station. You would respond to the Child Advocacy Center. And there are... Um, interviewers who are trained in interviewing children, forensic interviewers, and there are specially um, set up rooms with anatomically correct dolls and such so that we make this an appropriate interview for the child depending on what age that child is. In addition, we have been lucky enough to also be able to create a mock courtroom at our Child Advocacy Center. So as we move through the system, and if um, there's an election to prosecute um, someone for and hold them accountable, we can take our child victims to that mock courtroom and show them where the judge would sit, um, show them where they would sit, practice with them so that they're not, you know, the first time we get to a hearing, having walked into a courtroom and not knowing what to expect. We also have a diorama of a courtroom and where the judge would sit and where a jury would sit and where the attorneys would sit and where the defendant would sit so that we can minimize the trauma to our young victims of crime um, and make and, and work very hard to not make the system re-traumatize our victims by, by being as gentle as we can in their preparation. So we're super excited about our Child Advocacy Center. We're hoping to bring additional services to that center. And maybe Lorena here is a good time for you to talk about our partnership with CERVE and what they do at our, at our Child Advocacy Center. Okay, so our victim advocates uh, respond and meet with the child and the non-offending parent to provide services and emotional support. And one of the items that we talk about is um, referring them to Center for Family Services, um, which is housed at our center, our Child Advocacy Center. And um, we talk to them about, you know, the different services that they can provide, counseling. Um, and if the, if the non-offending parent is on board, um, we do the referral and uh, the Center for Family Services will contact them to do an intake 
And then based on the intake, they will then go ahead and schedule a follow-up appointment for the child and non-offending parent. So isn't there play therapy counseling sessions going on there? There is, they have their own um, room, um, play area room for therapy. Um, I haven't seen it um, recently, but I, I, um, I do recall that they do have a, an area where that they use for that right. purpose. Certain toys and things that they use to do play therapy with our young people. The Child Advocacy Center is very child centric. So there's uh, toys to play with while they're waiting. We have a beautiful mural on the wall. We have been blessed with stuffed animals that we can give out to children um, during this very trying time. Um, so we try to make it as, uh, we try to make sure that it's a comfortable place for our child victims to attend to so that we're not um, you know, putting them in an additional scary situation. Uh, so uh, I just want our listeners to know that that is available to us. We're very proud of it. We are going through our accreditation so that we're making sure that we're using the best practices that the scientists and the doctors um, that deal with trauma and deal with young people um, you know, recommend to us so that we're treating our young child victims of abuse, neglect, or sexual assault with the best care possible. So that's our commitment to you that we're going to go through that process and get that accreditation so we know that we're doing it right in Cumberland County. And so, I, I hope that viewers are recognizing too, all of this is intended to help anyone who is a victim or a parent of a victim to know that we are set up to, to deal sensitively and we encourage the reporting. We encourage you to gather the evidence and to be, we, we're trying to support you and partner with you in that process. Um, because we know oftentimes these things go unreported or underreported, and, and then that is uh, a problem throughout the county in so many other ways as well, because the trauma still is there, and then that uh, really does not go away without intervention. So our hope here is that we can provide a, a clear next step and, and some assurances about the process, and then uh, that reporting will happen. Uh, because Tony, am I right that um, there has been some drop during COVID, that there has been less reporting happening and that doesn't seem to match with reality and that's our concern? Yes, the concern is that um, assaults are still going on, but because of fears of coming into the hospital, um, the numbers of times we're being called out is a lot less than it was last year. So we hope by having and informing you um, having this program that will encourage you that you will be safe. Um, this county is com prosecutor's office is committed to doing the best that they can for you. And um, it's not just law enforcement, it's victim witness, it's the forensic nursing team. We are here as a team to support you and uh, help you as the best way we can. So um, just to kind of get to, I, we didn't mention our multidisciplinary team and I want to sh give them a shout out here and ask Lorena to just explain a little bit about what they do because we are in the process and we did um, get a very, a, a sizable grant to work on children exposed to violence um, and work on trauma. And some of that work is gonna take place and kind of move through the multidisciplinary team. So can you talk about that team and what that team does? And they also meet at the Child Advocacy Center or will be meeting once we get out of COVID. So can you talk about that a little bit, Lorena? Right. So our multidisciplinary team is made up of uh, dedicated professionals that share the same common goal, which is to prevent, detect, and prosecute crimes against children. And right now our MDT um, team is made up of our MDT coordinator, which is Kelly Kokoda, who is also one of our victim advocates, um, also assistant prosecutors, uh, detectives from our uh, special victims unit, um, our DCPMP liaison, our, our same coordinator, and our medical doctor from CARES. And um, they meet, um, they're actually meeting today um, to just go over case review. They go, um, they have different discussions 
um, just making sure that all services uh, were provided to um, the cases that come in through our office. So um, it's always our goal, and I say this about our victims all the time, that our victims are our only stakeholders that never ask to be in our system. So my goal is always to treat them with the dignity and respect to not to assure that our system does not re-victimize them. And the multidisciplinary team um, with all the representatives that Lorena has mentioned is very important because they sit around the table and they talk about a case, not about it's, you know, it's sanitized. So we're not talking about the person, we're talking about the case and making sure that nothing has fallen through the cracks, that the victim is getting all the services that they want to avail, avail themselves to, and that we are coordinating the services and the um, response in a way that if we are electing to prosecute it, we have the best possible prosecution available to us. And um, that multi multidisciplinary team is a big part of making sure that that happens. And it's nice that we, we have this beautiful conference room at the Child Ad Advocacy Center. It's set up very nicely. It has you know a TV so that people can be wired in. Um, and we're hoping that once COVID is, uh, we, we kick COVID's butt and that we can get back to our normal routines, that we can have a comfortable place for them to meet, to do the work that is so important to making sure that we're doing everything in our power to make our victims whole. So um, I, I think we've covered a lot, but is there anything else that Tony, either you or Lorena want to add that I did not cover that we need to let um, our public know um, to make sure that um, we, are, we are doing everything we can to kick sexual assault butt and neglect, abuse and neglect butt in Cumberland County. Well, um, if anyone would like SWART education, any community services, any um, first responders, law enforcement, uh, we certainly can set up a uh, educational presentation by Zoom if they're interested in uh, having some SWART education. So Tony is speaking my language. I say all the time, I'll go anywhere at any time to keep the residents of Cumberland County safe. So she's extending herself to say, if there's any group out there that would like to us to come out and talk about the sexual assault response team and the work that she does um, to make sure that our victims get the best possible response to sexual assault possible, then please reach out to the prosecutor's office I would direct you through Lorena Diaz so that we can put you in contact with Tony and we can get that set up for you. Uh, why don't you do a, a plug here, Tony, for the um, section? We, we're always looking for nurses too, right? Yes, we are. We're <laughs> continually looking for nurses um, who are interested in becoming forensic nurse. Um, in, the in the state of New Jersey, um, one of the only states that you are required to be certified as a forensic nurse examiner through the State Board of Nursing. So um, if you're interested in uh, helping victims, um, I know that's how I got started in it. I was a victim. I had a victim witness coordinator who helped me through the legal system. And as a nurse, I wanted to see what I could do to help others. And that's how I started doing this work many years ago. And um, please, we're out there to help you. Um, we're interested in um, giving you all the information we can provide. What, what, what is the cost to a, a nurse who's interested? Do we cover that cost if they get trained? Nurses, um, it's upfront cost to the nurses. And after the nurse is there for six months, then they're reimbursed for the cost of the course. So there is an upfront well, cost, but we want you to know that if you commit to us for six months, we cover that cost through our grants. Is that correct? That's correct. And there's also further training that um, Tony does a wonderful job of making sure that our nurses get the most up-to-date and um, relevant training so that they can stay, they can be at the forefront of this work. And oftentimes that comes through our grant as well. Um, I'm just so impressed by what you do, Tony. I'm impressed by the way you advocate for our program as well as our nurses to make sure they have all the equipment they need to do this job. 
and um, we should, in encouraging people, nurses who are interested in this program, we want them to know that if they become a SANE nurse, that we also reimburse them for their time when they're on call. Is that correct? That's correct. So, you know, there's a grant that we use that thankfully um, comes from the federal government that we are able to reimburse our um, nurses for the time that they spend doing the very professional job that they do. We're committed to that and we're encouraging any uh, nurse who wants to become a sane, a sane nurse to reach out to our office, go through Lorena at the uh, Office of Victim Witness and we will put you in touch with Tony Cotati so that we can get you in line to be a nurse. I would also just add, if you are watching this on Facebook, you could also just message us at, uh, on Facebook and then we would make sure we route that to the correct place. Yes, we oftentimes do that. So we can do that as well. Um, anything you wanna say in closing, Lorena? Um, just in terms of resources, we have a list of local state and federal resources by visiting our victim witness portal. And I can share that with you, Matt. Um, it's a long um, address for, for anybody who's interested in getting more information on resources. One, yeah, I'll we'll put it in the comments. And I'm just gonna give a big shout out because I remembered who gave us those wonderful um, stuffed animals. We have the Seropter Mist of uh, Cumberland County. Um, we're kind enough to, to donate our uh, stuffed animals that we have for our children at the Child Advocacy Center. There are so many organizations that are here locally that are willing to help. And we are very lucky to have served as a um, domestic violence, sexual assault provider. They do have a shelter. One thing we know about COVID is that, um, you know, people are suffering in silence. Oftentimes the crimes and the trauma that happen in our home, um, you know, is exacerbated by the fact that we have to stay home and we don't want anyone to feel like they're a prisoner in their home. So if you have a question related to being victimized, whether it be sexual assault, whether it be abuse, whether it be some other type of violence happening in your home, please feel free to reach out to the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office and or serve, and we will get you the help that you need. We are here, we are available, and we are making it work during COVID. And that's the message that we want out to our public. So um, I'm going to say thank you to both Tony and Lorena just taking a program that is so valuable and so necessary and just every day knocking it out of the park. Um, it's evident to me in the work that you do, how much you care about our victims, how much um, you go above and beyond to make sure that their needs are met. And I hope that this small segment has demonstrated that to our community. Um, we appreciate your time. We are here coping with COVID and we're asking you to come back often to our Facebook page or our YouTube page for new videos on how we can help you get through this pandemic. Last message, we will get through. Hold on, help is on the way. The vaccine is coming to the general population and we're gonna get through COVID together. The Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office is committed to being your partner in your health and well-being in Cumberland County. Thank you and have a good day.